you. Yes, I'm talking about you. This is the lecture for European history for uh, Friday, the 29th of October, 2021. We have talked about, well, first of all, I'll remind you, 3 o'clock this afternoon is the deadline. It is a firm deadline. I'm going to be submitting the grades between 3 o'clock and 3.15. And I'm getting out of here so that the debaters can come into my classroom and not mess them up. That's what I'm hoping. I'll even leave both podiums out in a way set up and designed for them to use. Because I'm that kind of guy. You are that kind yes. Of I just wanted to tell you why I'm tired. Don't be uh, sure. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. We'll find out later if we have time. Well, you can I'm... tell me when it's not at the beginning of my class. <laughs> That's the best time to say to you. Editor. I don't do that. Either. So, uh, we talked about Philip II, King of Spain. His devout Roman Catholicism. His uh, life. When working, he lives like a monk. No luxuries, just work and prayer and sleep, and that's it. Now, what that is is a well-lived life because he's a dedicated king. You can say many things about Philip II, but no one ever questioned his work ethic. He was a hard-working monarch. He cared deeply about making Spain serve the good, as he saw it. And one of his projects was England. When he was married to Queen Mary, England was Catholicizing, but when Mary died and was replaced by Queen Elizabeth I, that all changed. She then led him on for well over a decade. Maybe I'll be your husband. Maybe not. I've got to think about it. So, um... Eventually, he realizes he's being played as a fool, and he doesn't like this. So, he is going to re-Catholicize England by force, thus the uh, creation of the Invincible Armada. Here's the thing. If you ever design a ship like the RMS Titanic, don't call it unsinkable. And if you ever uh, construct a battle fleet... Don't call it invincible before it goes into battle. This is like living on Easy Street. When Tina and I, my wife and I, were looking for a house in Maine, we ended up building. Um, we ended up living on a place called Stonecrest Drive, which was a, a brand new area. We had an acre of land, half wood. It was beautiful. Um, but there was another house in competition on Easy Street. Now, Back in the 60s and 70s, people used to say, I've made it. I'm living on Easy Street. Usually right before Cosmic Smackdown occurs because of hubris. So uh, when I think of living on Easy Street, I think of the place when the next asteroid's going to hit or where Godzilla's going to awaken from his underground slumbers. I think living on Easy Street is basically daring God to mess with you. Um, it's like saying in a horror movie, Nothing else can go wrong, can it? <laughs> We're saying in politics, it can't get any worse than it already is. Oh, you foolish people. That's like splitting up in a horror movie. Yeah, I think we should split up in this horror uh, haunted house. Uh, yeah, we'll each go with maybe one shady partner. Don't do that. Don't call your ship unsinkable. Don't say nothing else can go wrong. Don't live on easy street. Don't call the Armada invincible before it sails. That is just asking for trouble. Yes? You said in politics how people are like, it can't get any worse than this. Oh, yes, it can. We were proved wrong last November. Oh, no, Haley, you don't understand. It's not as bad as it could be. It may not even be as bad as it will be. Yes. Uh, so, it can, in fact, get worse. Uh... But it's not great. Uh, I, I will certainly say that I don't think things are great right now. Because Orange Man may have been bad, but Orange Man was competent. And that helps. Who's Orange Man? <laughs> President <laughs> Donald J. Trump. Ah, yes. yes. Have you seen orange. the little meme where it's like, you know the filter with the orange? And it's just on... 
Yeah, I've seen that. I've also seen the kitten meme and the lawyer saying to the judge, I'm not really a kitten. My grandchildren were playing with my computer. And this lawyer has this kitten face and he's talking to her from a few year, uh, months ago. Okay. So the Armada is composed of galleons and galleasses, big, giant Spanish ships with short wing, short wings, short range weaponry. And these short range weapons are designed to bring the ship up close, pepper the ship, uh, the enemy ship, uh, and, and kill a lot of their crew, and then send troops over to capture. All right. So, who was Donald Trump's favorite Civil War general? I would assume uh, Sheridan. Stonewall Jackson. Ah, okay. Stonewall. <laughs> ah, ah. That was funny. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, I think he did like Stonewall Jackson. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's that's good. That's that's fine. <laughs> it's nice to know. It's nice to know that I am not the only one who tells dad jokes. In here. Uh, the English use a more caramel shaped ship, smaller, with longer range guns. It's not designed to get close and capture ships. It's designed to dance around at a distance and sink them at long range. Okay, cool. So you're talking about boats. This just reminded me. I was watching a show, and it's like a baking show, but it's a baking engineering show, so it's baconary. And they no, have it's end jaking. No, it's called baconary. They call it baconary. They are wrong. It's end jaking. No. It's like craisins are not really craisins. They're cran raisins. Everyone knows this. <laughs> Or raspberries. Go. Anyways, so basically, they had to make stuff, and what the first thing they made was a boat, and it had to be pretty much all edible, and it had to float on like this long stretch of water, mm -hmm. and they had to get like to the end in like forty-five seconds. And there's like two, no, there's one boat, two boats that didn't fall over in the water. The rest just what were they made of? I I would think making it out of sort of a cookie like those. Uh, so one one group of people made it out of. Dead, dead, dead dough, these people. Okay. And basically, once you bake it, it's super hard, but it's also kind of buoyant. Okay. And then chocolate. That's chocolate smart. 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 Here's what you don't make it out of. Sourdough. Because <laughs> it'll absorb and sink. Now that we've uh, established that the Spaniards were wise in not making their ship, ships out of sourdough... <laughs> uh, Sir Francis Drake delays the invasion by raiding Cadiz and uh, destroying the barrel staves of the entire Spanish Armada. Two years later, though, in 1588, the Spanish Armada is on the way. They are spotted entering the English Channel. The beacons are lit. The message is uh, uh, sent breathlessly to Sir Walter Raleigh. I said Sir Francis Drake yesterday. No, it was Sir Walter Raleigh that was in charge of the British fleet at the Battle of the Armada. And uh, it was Walter Raleigh that said... That's nice. We have we have time for one more game of bowls, which is just ulti ultimate ultimate stiff upper upper lipidness on the part of the English. It's also really because the fleet couldn't sail until the tides changed that evening. So the British come out and they harass the Spaniards. They fire at long range and dance away, and the Spaniards are like charging elephants, but they're too slow. And the British also send in at night fire ships to disrupt the Spanish formation. And the Spanish formation is this dense pack crescent moon because their admiral is a land commander, the Duke of Medina Sedona. And he doesn't appreciate that ships are different from soldiers. <sighs> yes. Um, I was going to ask, did you say Sir Walter Raleigh? Was Raleigh, Raleigh was, um, was in charge of the British? Yes, yeah, okay. the English. Okay. Yes. So it was the Duke of Medina Sedona in charge of the Espanyards. Yes. Why would a land general be picked to lead a naval battle with the most powerful fleet? Okay. I wonder that too. But what I'll tell you is this the job of the Armada was not really to win a naval battle. They expected that the British would just be ridiculously outclassed. The job was to land in the Low Countries and bring an army over. Gotcha. So uh, he was chosen more for his uh, ability to command ground troops because eventually that's what it would involve. Mm -hmm. um, or he was connected. I don't know. To me, kind of a bad idea. You, know, you, you can see looking at politics in the news today that uh, bad ideas just 
art happen sometimes. They they All the time. They, they just occur. <laughs> It's the good ideas that you appreciate because they're special. They're unusual. They're nice and rare. Yes, it's like... So, uh, the Spaniards are uh, basically enraged by the British tactics, and they miss their exit. Instead of turning when they need to turn, given the winds and the tides and the currents, they keep following the British until somebody tells the Duke of Medina Sedona it's too late. We can't go back and land not and maintain the fleet as a fleet. And he says, well, we'll maintain the fleet as a fleet. We'll go around the British Isles. We'll go north of Scotland, around Ireland, and then we'll go back again into the Channel, and this time we won't get distracted. But an English wind blew out of the north. A storm wind. Actually, several horrible North Atlantic storms. And destroyed what was left of the Spanish fleet. Spanish fleet leaves with several hundred warships, comes back with fewer than 50, and those are damaged. Uh, the Armada is destroyed. Several Spaniards, several hundred Spaniards, maybe a thousand, end up on Irish shores and being fellow Catholics. While some of the Spaniards are killed, uh, some of the Spaniards are sheltered, and they end up uh, breeding with Irish women and producing my family, among other things. My grandmother's family were black Irish which are Irish people with very dark hair and very dark eyes. That tends to be a result of um, having contact with some descendants of the Spanish Armada. Did you have a question? Okay. So, that's where we were. This is important. Muito importante. Because we, the United States of America, originate from England. And English history is the history of a Protestant nation at war with much of Catholic Europe. That's the country that colonizes us. Had England been conquered by Spain, it would not have had the need to or the energy to colonize the eastern seaboard of North America. Instead, the English would have been helping the Spaniards build up their empire or they would have built the empire of England right next to Spain's colonies. Even when I was a kid and an ardent patriotic Roman Catholic, I understood that I couldn't root for the Spanish Armada too much because if I did, I'd be rooting for the side that would not allow America to come about. So now we're approaching the high point, the intensification of religious crisis and religious war. Any questions, though, first? Okay. Queen Elizabeth never marries. She is the virgin queen forevermore, and she is the namesake of the colony of uh, Virginia, which becomes the Commonwealth of Virginia to this day. Virginia and West Virginia are named after Queen Elizabeth I. So, when you have a society, a culture whose core beliefs have been ripped apart like a cat's hind claws rip open a, 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 a target's belly, Christianity had been the core belief of Western European civilization. And when the church splits with Luther, it starts a process that leads to the Radical Reformation, Baptists, Anabaptists, Quakers, Shakers, and so forth. It leads to the Reformed Christian movement. It leads to the Church of England. It leads to all sorts of trouble and war. And all of this creates something that you and I should be somewhat familiar with. It's hard to relax and just live your life. It's hard to relax and trust that your neighbors are good people who have your back. It's hard to relax because those neighbors are dirty Catholics or rotten Protestants. Because those neighbors don't share the same 
belief system that you share. And in fact, whether it's the papist conspiracies or the Jesuit conspiracies or the conspiracies of those crazy Calvinists, people now look upon their neighbors with suspicion. Even in solidly Catholic countries and in solidly Lutheran countries, people watch to see if somebody is a religious heretic or traitor. It affects everything. And it's bad enough when things are good and we're not trusting one another. But if we're not trusting one another and things get bad, things go to hell really fast. Our country is divided. Wasn't as divided when I was your age. Wasn't as divided when I was born. It's divided because there are people who question the very traditional notion of Western civilization. They call it patriarchy. They call it white supremacy. They call it cisgender normativeness. They call it all sorts of other things. But what they mean is that the Western civilization, which is the only society on earth to produce concepts of human rights and a functionally free government system, isn't good enough because it doesn't match their utopian goals. They want to replace us with a new us, an improved us, a socialistic us, an us where everyone can explore their identity and there's no such thing as tyranny or oppression, even microaggression. Because everyone will suddenly realize that there's only one right answer, the woke answer. On the other hand, you've got bat nut crazy conservatives who believe that these are tools of Satan and they go to the opposite extreme. I have to admit this. I don't like admitting it, but there are people on my side of the political divide that are bat nuts crazy. And there are people on the left who are bat nuts crazy too. The first thing you can do to maintain your mental health in these difficult times is to remember good people disagree about all sorts of stuff. I've talked about this, I'm just mentioning it in passing now. Good people can disagree with almost everything you believe in and still be good and still be smart. They're just wrong from your point of view and you're wrong from theirs. I'm not saying there is no truth, I'm not a moral relativist. I am saying that humility is necessary for sanity. Humility says you're not the smartest person in every room you're in. Humility says that everyone who disagrees with you isn't just a dumb bottom. Humility says your opinions are the opinions of a mortal, fallible human being capable of error. And the moment when you feel that sense of rectitude and righteousness is, is probably the moment <laughs> when you're going to leave the road of objective reality and enter the road of the fanatic. Because it feels good. Because it feels right. Accept my warning or not, it's heartfelt. I've seen a lot of good people go into cloud cuckoo land. Not because they're bad. Not because they're stupid but because they assume that other people are, very easily. In any event, this is what's happening in Europe, but worse than we have it yet. We have people, when there's a child going missing, or when there's a, an outbreak, a last gasp of the plague, or, or of some other disease, when a city is under siege and you're worrying about traitors within the walls, uh, what do you do? You look hard at your neighbors, and you try to find the traitors. Yeah, people won't ever go wrong doing that, looking hard at their neighbors to find the traitors. Make sure, yes, thank you. So, some of the traitors are evil witches. Witch burnings, worse than anything since the Black Death, occur throughout this period. Because it's not just those Catholics or those Protestants that are a problem. 
because Christianity has been divided by those traitorous people, witches, Satanists, demons, and other evil things now are loose in the world. It's during this period that we have in the United States, well, no, in the, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, or Plymouth, I forget it, it may have still been Plymouth, the Salem Witch Trials. Because things are happening. And the women are probably involved. Because, you know, women. And so let's find them. And why are the women's going off track? Because they're not good people anymore. They may call each other good wife or goody, but there are some witches. And what do you do with witches? Well, the Old Testament is very clear. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. You burn them. Yes, I got it right. There you go. <laughs> Raise your hand and wait to be called. You're right. That's good. Burn them! <laughs> so... Witch burnings become more and more common as this hysteria and distrust molts, multiplies, spreads. Any questions on that? Before we get into the high point, slash low point, slash fulcrum, slash cauldron, slash holocaust, that is the Thirty Years War. Okay, so the center of Europe is the Holy Roman Empire. It includes northern Italy, Switzerland, Austria, parts of Hungary, Germany, parts of France, Luxembourg, Belgium, Holland, parts of Poland, and the Czech land, parts of Slovakia, even parts of Slovenia and Croatia. Center of Europe. And it's ruled, nominally, in a loose way, by the Holy Roman Emperor, who is a Habsburg. Charles V, or Maximilian, one of these guys who's related to Philip II. But, the German region, which is at the heart of the Holy Roman Empire, is split. The southern third of Germany remains loyally Catholic. The northern two-thirds of Germany is either totally Lutheran or partially Lutheran with mixed. The Peace of Augsburg was an attempt to sell, settle this in the mid-1500s. The religion of the king is the religion of the people, Catholic, Protestant, or Protestant, that is Lutheran. But because it doesn't take into account the Radical Reformation or Reformed Christianity, that's Calvinism, it's not going to work. So tensions build and build and build. And the imperial officials are trying to quietly but firmly encourage Catholicism in these middle lands, which include Czech lands, Bohemia and Moravia, which include the capital city of the Czech lands, Prague. <laughs> An imperial delegation goes to Prague. That imperial delegation wishes to establish certain laws that will control the situation, that will <clears throat> preserve the power of the Roman Catholic Church. And, <clears throat> and, and the power of the House of Habsburg. Whereas <clears throat> a number of Czechs who are Protestant Make sure your notes are out. A number of Czechs who are Protestant are feeling oppressed by this. So at a conference, which takes place on the second or third floor, matters of debate come to a head. And a mob of Czechs <clears throat> grab the imperial officials, drive them towards the windows, and wing them out! They throw them out the windows. Now, luckily, they land in giant piles of solid waste, animal and human. But there's still some pretty grievous uh, injuries. This event 
is called the defenestration of Prague. Because defenestrating something is throwing it out the window. When I finally left high school behind and got an electric typewriter to work at college, I took my manual typewriter with its tiny little keys and its giant gaping openings with sharp metal that, have, that had lacerated my fingers for the last four years. And I threw it out the window, I defenestrated it, then I picked up the remains, I brought it over to the dumpster, and as hard as I possibly can, I hurled it at the back wall of the dumpster. And it made a very satisfying explosion. It wasn't, you know, a boom explosion, it was just, it just shattered. You should try that. Oh, I hated that die thing. Yes? Okay, so at work we have a glass bucket. And, okay, we Why? Because, like... You have a bar. Okay. You know, like, we break things okay. 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 Oh, a bucket for glasses. Yeah. Not a bucket made of glass. No. Okay. No. A bucket for glasses. Yes. So yes. That makes total sense. These, these buckets at the end of the day. Usually, buses do. And we take the buckets and we bring them out back, and we throw them as hard as we can into the green dumpster. And when you're having a bad day, or when people are oh, it feels the good. Oh, well, it's so sad. It's called catharsis. What you're doing is you're working out your stress. <laughs> Well, the glasses, the, the, the only thing is they're really thick, so it's really hard to break them. Mm -hmm. So you have to throw them really, like, really Just hard. Just watch your eyes when you do something like that. Well, see, I'm sorry. Um, I threw it really hard, but I missed, and I hit the concrete wall behind it, and it, the yeah. one time it breaks, it breaks on the concrete. Yeah, and I so you have to clean it up. Yeah. That's only fair. Yeah. Um, which is the moral of the story, if you're going to shoot, shoot straight! Uh, so, with the defenestration of Prague, peaceful negotiations, peaceful struggle, the Cold War phase is over. And we begin the most complicated war in German history. <laughs> and again, this is Germany. That's saying something. It's not like it's an unwarlike area. The Thirty Years' War roughly lasts from 1614 to 1648. Let's see, what's 48 minus 14? 38, 34. So the Thirty Years' War is actually longer, but there are moments of peace in it. In any case, it's sort of a rough approximation. It's like saying seven days creation. It's not 24-hour days, necessarily. It's like saying uh, Jesus was starving for 40 days. No, it's it's not 40 days precisely. It's, a, it's about a month. A little longer. Okay. <clears throat> So, there are four phases to this war, and it involves all sorts of powers inside of Germany and outside of Germany. So, starts out with the Bohemian phase, with the intense phase of part of the war, up here, being in the Czech lands, surrounded by these mountains, this area right here, non-German area of the Central Holy Roman Empire. The Bohemian phase. Then there's the Danish phase, where you get Denmark involved. That's the northern border here. Then there's the Swedish phase, because the Swedes land armies in northern Germany, and they march around helping the Protestants, the Lutherans. Then there is the <coughs> Franco-Swedish the Franco-Swedish phase, <coughs> where the French are helping the Catholics, and the Swedes are helping the Protestants. And by this point, it's not really about the religion. <clears throat> it's about whether Sweden will dominate the Baltic, whether France will get more territory towards the Rhine, <clears throat> whether Germany will be able to maintain any type of independence, or whether Germany will become the tool and colonies of outside powers. I could go on. It is the bloodiest war by far in German history, except for really the last nine months of World War II. And that's saying something, too. To give you an indication of what it was like, I'm going to read to you a translation of a primary source document on the destruction of the city of Magdeburg. Magdeburg is a big German city. So, <clears throat> listen, follow along. If you want, if you're cold, you can close the windows, but leave the fan on. So, it begins with a blurb. So I'm reading a 
an encyclopedia entry introducing the document. The Thirty Years' War was the last of the religious wars of the Reformation on the European mainland. But it was also very much a war of politics and of national interests. It was primarily fought within the Holy Roman Empire, but not exclusively. The war went through several, several stages. The combatants varied from place to place and from decade to decade. In Bohemia, that's the Czech lands, the war was fought between Catholics and Calvinists, that's Reformed Christians. Although it was also a response to the German Habsburg dynasty's attempt to increase its power over the state. Again, these imperial officials that were thrown out the window weren't just trying to suppress the Calvinists. They were also trying to expand imperial power where imperial power had never been before. It was a power grab. Uh, blip, 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 blip. Danish Lutherans entered the war in order to protect Protestants in Germany from the attempts by the Habsburgs to re-Catholicize the German states as they were attempting to do in Bohemia. In contrast, the war in Sweden was clearly mostly one of politics. King Gustavus Adolphus used the opportunity to try and establish his kingdom's dominance over the Baltic Sea, coastlines, north and south. The settlement to the war, the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, ensured that politics and faith would remain intertwined. The treaty allowed for individual rulers within the Holy Roman Empire to decide what would be the official faith of his own state, Catholic, Protestant, or Reformed. That's key, or Reformed. The following excerpt describes the massacre of Protestants in the German city of Magdeburg in 1631, which brought Gustavus Adolphus renewed determination to fight the German Catholic princes. So, that's the introduction. Now, as I read, there are three things you may want to consider. Number one, one characteristic of the war was the improvement in guns and their efficiency. How did that affect the siege of Magdeburg? So you're looking for gunpowder stuff. Two, which do you think was more multinational in character in this case, the Protestants or the Catholics? Multinational in character. Three, what might have been the motivation for the Imperial Army's sacking of Magdeburg? Do you think it was about religion? Do I need to repeat any of those? So the order, right, you accept summary. Is there evidence of gunpowder weapon changes that might affect things? Which is more multinational, Catholics or Protestants? And was the sacking a result of religious or other impulses? Okay. Uh, this is from Readings in European History. The destruction of Magdeburg, May 16 and 31. So then, General Pappenheim collected a number of his people on the ramparts by the new town and brought them from there into the streets of the city. Von Falkenburg was shot, and fires were kindled in different quarters. Then, indeed, it was all over with the city, and further resistance was useless. Nevertheless, some of the soldiers and citizens of Magdeburg did try to make a stand here and there. But the imperial troops, that's the Catholic troops, kept bringing on more and more forces, cavalry too, to help them. And finally, they got the Krokenthor open, that's the great gate, and they let in the whole Imperial Army and the forces of the Catholic League. Hungarians, Croats, Poles, Walloons, Italians, Spaniards, French, North and South Germans. Thus it came about that the city and all its inhabitants fell into the hands of the enemy whose violence and cruelty were due in part to their common hatred of the adherents of the Augsburg Confessions, that's their hatred of Lutherans, and in part 
to their being embittered by the chain shot which had been fired at them. What's chain shot? Imagine filling a cannon, not with a cannonball, but with chains. What's going to happen when you shoot it? It's like an evil shotgun of death. The chains will spin out randomly and basically go whizzing across the battlefield, cutting people in half. It is considered by anyone on the receiving end of it nasty and not the kind of weapon that you want to encourage. So the use of chain shot was discouraged by the reprisals that the army is about to take. Okay, by the use of chain shot, which, which had been fired at them, at them, and by the derision and insults that the Magdeburgers had heaped upon the Imperial Army from the ramparts. You stink, you're lousy soldiers, your mother dresses you funny and you're ugly. <laughs> then, was there not but beating and burning, plundering, torture and murder? Most especially was every one of the enemy bent on securing much booty. When a marauding party entered a house, if its master had anything to give, he might thereby purchase respite and protection for himself and, from his, and for his family until the next man, who also wanted something, should come along. It was only when everything had been brought forth and there was nothing left to give that the real trouble commenced. Then, what with blows and threats of shooting and stabbing and hanging, the poor people were so terrified that if they had anything left, they would have brought it forth if they had been buried in the earth or hidden away in a thousand castles. In this frenzied rage, the great and splendid city that had stood stood like a fair princess in the land, was now in its hour of direst need and unutterable distress and woe, given over to the flames and thousands of innocent men, women, and children, in the midst of a horrible din of heart-rending shrieks and cries, were tortured and put to death in so cruel and shameful a manner that no words would suffice to describe, nor tears to bewail it. Thus, in a single day, this noble and famous city, the pride of the whole country, went up in fire and smoke, and the remains of its citizens, the remnants, should I say, of its citizens, with their wives and children, were taken prisoners and driven away by the enemy with a noise of weeping and wailing that could be heard from afar, while the cinders and ashes from the town were carried by the wind to Walzenben, Eglin, and still more distant places. In addition to all of this, quantities of sumptuous and irreplaceable house furnishings and moving property of all kinds, such as books, manuscripts, paintings, memorials, of memorabilia of all sorts, which money could not buy, were either burned or carried away by the soldiers as booty. The most magnificent garments, hanging, silk stuffs, gold and silver lace, linen of all sorts, and other household goods were brought by the army sutlers for a mere song and peddled about by the cart load all through the Archbishopric of Magdeburg and in Anhalt and Brunswick. Gold chains and rings, jewels of every kind of gold and silver utensils were to be bought from the common soldiers for a tenth of their real value. So, which was the more uh, international? The Imperial Army and its allies or the defenders? Gonna pick someone randomly, 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 randomly. You. You. I think it was the, the army, army attack. So. Yeah, it was the Imperials. They went out of their way to list all the members of the Catholic League that were involved. So the Imperials were more international. What gunpowder innovation is mentioned in this story, Alexa? What weapon? It's the chain shot, uh, which is going to make things worse. It's bad enough to have a cannonball thrown at you, or grape shot shot at you. Grape shot is like shotgun you know, pellets. But chain shot bounces. It's completely unpredictable. The cannon could be aiming this way, and you might get hit if the chain shot bounces properly. 
So it is a scary, scary weapon. It's a terror weapon. Yeah. What is Grimshaw actually made of? Oh, it's iron, usually. Oh, just iron. You just get iron, you know, make it, you, you can make it out of lead, uh, you can make it out of bronze, uh, just any cheapo metal that you make into little round balls. Gotcha. And it's the size of the balls that determine. You've got um, grape shot, and then you've got cannonballs, and the cannonball is meant to be a single shot with mm -hmm. grape shot, and chain shot is just nasty. You know, at sea, they used to put silverware in the cannons when they ran out of uh, other things. Really? So you had forks and knives fired out of a cannon into an enemy ship. You know, you get <gasps> fraught. Yeah. What? Quickly. Oh, it's a really long book. No. Oh, no, wait. Then wait. No, she's being honest, and I appreciate the honesty. I do. So, uh, why did they sack the city? Why did the soldiers do what they did? Was it, yeah. So they could have the money. Yeah, that's one of the things. We don't fight just for God. We fight for glory and gold. <laughs> yeah, gold. Uh, so they wanted to be wealthy. And what soldiers do, uh, if their employers let them, is they take everything from the people they conquer. Everything that they want. And then some. What else might have embittered them and made them angry enough to just rip in? So after, like, they've been, like, teased and stuff, they're really mad, so they want to just, like, take everything so the other people don't have it. Yeah. Uh, if you're in a siege and there's an army outside and you think they might win, don't go up onto the walls and, 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 and yell at them. Why? Because they'll remember you and they'll come after you and they'll get you. Yeah, so so don't do that. And uh, obviously the chain shot had something to do with it too. What you've got to understand is what made the last nine months of World War II so horrible was that it was total war. It's not that the armies were fighting the other armies. Every German was a target, and rightly so, because every Pole and every Englishman and every Frenchman uh, during the time of war had been a target. Every Russian had been a target. Total war means you fight not just the enemy's government, but you fight the enemy's people. You kill as many of them as you can. You destroy their ability to fight, you destroy their ability to organize, you destroy their civilization. That's what was going on in the Thirty Years' War and at the end of World War II. The Germans had sown the wind by terror bombing Warsaw and Rotterdam and Coventry and London. <laughs> Well, they learned that the Allies did strategic bombing better than they ever could. They had two engine bombers. We had four engine bombers. They used high explosives. Yeah, we used that, but we also used fire bombs, napalm, gelatinized gasoline that burns and is sticky. We burned entire German cities. More people were killed in the fire bombing of Dresden, Germany, and Tokyo, Japan, than were killed. Shh then were killed in either atom bomb attack on Hiroshima or Nagasaki. You don't need atom bombs to kill lots of people. You need napalm and the will to use it. And in 1944-45, after all the stuff the Axis had pulled, we had the will to use it. During the Thirty Years' War, everyone was a target. Men, women, children, soldiers, civilians, the old, the young, their property, their pets, their livestock, everything. No holding back. So this notion of rules of war, of civilized war, of war crimes, forget about it. If you're in power, you do whatever you want. You can't wear that. You do whatever you want because you have the power and because your enemy would do it to you. Total war is horrific war. In the American Civil War at the end, uh, General Sherman practiced it on his march through Georgia to the sea when he destroyed Atlanta and a number of other cities. If you're in a war, much better to have the kind of little and medium wars we've been having for the last 20 years than to be in a total war like we were in the Anyway, it's ended by the Peace of Westphalia. The religion of the king is the religion of the people, Catholic, Protestant, to reform. And while there are still religious problems like in the British Isles, which we'll talk about next unit, um, this is the conclusion of major wars of religion among Christian European nations. Next week, the Age of Discovery and the Scientific Revolution and your exam. Oh my gosh, exam? Can I tell my joke now? Well, you see, she doesn't have her hand up. Hi. Hi. Yes. So, I was 
I was just going to try to make you feel bad so I made you let me take a nap. Wouldn't have. I have no mercy about oh, yeah? things like that. Well, I was just going to tell you that the reason I can't take this is my friend. I'm sorry to hear that. That doesn't make it possible for you to sleep in my class. Though. I figured. Anyways, my joke is really funny. Okay. okay. It's more like, not like Don't build really it up. Say it's a little joke. And then let Len then surprise us with your humor. Go! Okay, so there was once this singer who, she could only say, um, me, 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 me. And then there was a, um, a candy store owner who said, goody, goody, gumdrops. That's all he could say. And then there was, like, this baker who could only say forks and knives. And so one day they're like all walking on the street together and then they see like this dead man and a police officer comes and they're like, who did this? And the singer's like, he, 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 he. And then, and then he was like, how'd you guys do it? And then the baker was like, forks and knives, forks and knives. And then the, it was like, you guys are all going to jail, the cops are there. And then, there, and then the, the candy shop owner was like, goody, 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 cops. Thank you. Between David's joke at the beginning and your joke at the end, I feel totally bruised. Have a nice day.